Well, well, well welcome. Um, good to see you all. My name is Paul. I'm a student minister at um, St. Stephen's in Surrey Hills Presbyterian Church. Um, it is a great pleasure and a privilege um, to share the Word of God today. Um, thank you for uh, your faithfulness in the Lord, uh, that you serve the church and be part of the church and persevere through the difficult times. Before we jump in, um, let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for, the, for your word um, this morning. Um, and now we come to ponder your word. Help us to fix our eyes onto you, Jesus, and your word. Let the words we speak and think be pleasing to you, be um, pleasing to you in your name. Amen. I'd like to start with a big question. Don't be frightened. What does Christian live for and how should they live? What do Christians live for and how should they live? It's a big question, particularly when there's a pressure, things that sudden a pressure or grief or sadness wallops us. Sometimes we forget what the purpose, what's the direction, and how we're supposed to live. Um, some, of us, some, some of us here may have been a Christian for a long time. Some of us maybe still are waving through and also working it out their faith and trying to work out who Jesus is. Whatever that we are, we have to know what the purpose Christians are living for. Uh, you may find a bulletin on your um, newsletter. Uh, there should be a, a, a questions and answers, hopefully. Yes, you can write it down as you go. So big idea today is Christians strain forward for new purpose, forgetting what is behind. I repeat that. Christian strain forward for a new purpose, forgetting what is behind. Why does this matter? Why do we have to know the purpose? I have to convince you, right? Why does it even matter? Well, because, just simply put, it does matter to know what the purpose is. It does matter to our life, matters to our faith. If we are truly Christians, the followers of Christ, we have to know what we should live for and how. This will ultimately determine the meaning of our life and direction purpose of our life. Without it, we are just going to randomly, aimlessly wander around. Let's think about this. What happens if you're going out to the street, going out to go somewhere else without a phone? Nowadays, you can't do anything without a phone, right? Well, I'm not an exception. What, what happens if you go out without a phone? Or maps. It is going to be frustrating. You can tell. It is going to be confusion and chaos because we don't know where to go. Particularly if you have to head somewhere else and completely new. You haven't been, you've been there before. That means you have to work out how to get there and where that is. Do I turn left here or do I go straight here? Utter confusion. We can't move. We can't go forward. We get lost without maps and directions. And that's what purpose does to our life. That's what happens to life when we don't have a destination. Purpose is a map to us. It does not only help us to realize what, where, where the destination is, but also directs us how to get there. The passage we read today is a very interesting passage because it tells us what purpose we should live for and how we should live. This passage is our map today and for us to navigate through our Christian life. I'm going to go through three points and one extra point. And we are going to navigate through the, through the three points as we are walking through a timeline, okay? Number one, past. Number two, present. Number three, future. Hopefully that's a straightforward. Past, present, and future. Okay, in detail, number one, the past is past pursuit, what the Christians were doing before founding Christ. Number two, present purpose, what Christians should live for. That's the purpose. Number three, Future pursuit, what Christians should be doing for the purpose. And the one extra point is Jesus holding and God's calling. Why don't we begin? The first point, past pursuit. What do we notice when someone becomes a Christian? What do we notice when someone comes to faith? Um, some people may ask, oh, well, he becomes or she becomes a richer. Or does turn out to be a better look? Or maybe have a bit of, sen bit of better sensibility or a bit of sense of better, let's say, aesthetics. But in fact, we all know that's not true. 
It's not about you getting richer. It's not about you getting more competent or have a better sense of aesthetics. But what change do we notice when someone becomes a Christian? And that is the person takes a big turnaround. The Christian has a different priority, values and direction. The Christian has a new purpose. New purpose leads to new life, which gives new lens to our past. If the person just wanted to become a successful before knowing Christ, then the person will have a totally different life. It won't be the same 80 hours a week of hard work and grinding, chasing after success. But when, it, when he or she becomes a Christian, coming to Sunday morning service, listening to God's Word, fighting through this urge of sleeping in on Sunday morning, and this person will look back his, his past or her past and might think all of that wasn't actually worth it. All these hours of hard working, the, the desire, that urge to chase of success doesn't even matter anymore. When we read today's passage today, we find a man who had a big turnaround, encountering new purpose and took completely new assessment on his own past. And it's Paul, the author of the passage today. Please come with me. If you have a Bible with you, please keep it open. Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to keep delving into it. Okay, so this is verse 4 to 7. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has, the, he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, of Hebrew of Hebrews, as to law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul's life, his life was regarded as perfect life, a blameless life in, in, the, in, the, in the eyes of the world. He was a pure-blooded Jew, a lecturer of the best law school of his time, and a well-spoken political leader all at the same time. It's a quite an quite achievement. Despite all of these, Paul was not, not proud of these at all. Rather, he saw them as rubbish. And that was quite a good reading, by the way. I, really, I could really feel the weight and the emotion of the passage today. Absolutely worth nothing. That's Paul saying when it compares to Jesus Christ. Have a look at verse 8 again. It says this, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And what does it say again? Indeed, I count everything as loss. What is that everything? That everything is his past. Everything achieved. He said it is loss. Everything he had worked on, grind on, achieved, means nothing to him now. He takes even further in verse 9, says, I count them as rubbish. If you take more literal meaning of the rubbish, it means filth. Something that you say bye-bye in your bathroom, right? That highlights what he thought of his past. That is absolutely meaningless. It's an actual waste. It seems to be a bit disrespectful to his own, right? Why did he have to do this to himself? Like, why did he claim such a big statement, almost sound like he's insulting and trashing his own past? And we all know, and because simply, Paul has something way better, something better, so much better, that he has now no shame and have full audacity to say that what he had worked on, what he had died and cherished it for, is nothing now. It's all filth. He has something far greater than for his life. Turn with me in verse 8 and 9, says this, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as a rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. It's just because knowing and gaining Jesus Christ, let alone that has a greater value and worth than what he has worked on for his entire life. He gave up all he had. Because all the things that Paul worked on, tried and accomplished, and was on his effort, his own effort. Verse 9 says this, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law. It was his own effort. In fact, all of his effort was to be counted, be, be counted righteousness, righteous before God. 
He did everything he could do. And actually, what's interesting is he actually achieved it. The, the very level, almost the perfect, the blameless level of his achievement as a law teacher, a proud leader of his own people. But all of these was counted as loss because he was looking for, he's finding, he was reaching out for the righteousness of God. All of these toils and hard work was to be counted righteous before God. Let's come back to verse 9, says this, and be found in him, and so on, and but that which comes from the faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Be found in him. Instead of hard working and finding his own righteousness before God, he wanted to be found now. He wanted to be found. It's not his effort anymore. He wanted to be found in Christ Jesus. Why? The verse 9 says this, the righteousness of from God, Jesus Christ. Because there is a righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, a righteousness that Paul was looking for, though he had audacity to say he was blameless in, in law in verse 6, but his searching, his finding, his effort were never enough for righteousness. He was searching and finding the righteousness of God, which is the right destination we should pursue. But he didn't have the maps. He didn't know where to go. He was on the journey on his own without knowing where to go, without a map. Now, Paul is found. Paul is found in Jesus Christ, the righteousness from God. From that moment on, God sees Paul in the lens of Jesus. God sees Paul through the Jesus who is righteous, his righteousness. That means everyone who is in Christ, who is seen through Christ, is righteous. Paul is found in Jesus, in righteousness. Paul gained the righteousness of God because Paul gained Jesus. Christians are found in Jesus. Christians gained the righteousness of God, not because of our searching, not because of their hard work, but because the Christians, we gain Christ. Paul, count, Paul counted his past as loss because he was, count, he was counted righteous before God. If you were counted righteous before God now, then what have you given up? What did it look like? What are the things that, that you observe as a Christian that you naturally or quite willingly gave up for Christ? Was that a friendship that pulls you into a place where you make your sin? Or was it ambition that you hold up before because you now, but now you, you gave up because you received so much greater than your own ambition? What did we lose? What did we count as a loss, as Paul said, when we were found in Jesus? Or did we lose anything at all? Point number two, present purpose. Now, Paul has a map. Paul has a map. He has Jesus. He gained Jesus. Now, he has a different direction compared to his past, different purpose to himself. Therefore, his past has nothing to do with him, but it is all about Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God. This means, if I just put it simple, Jesus Christ is Paul's purpose. Jesus Christ is Christian's purpose. He is, Jesus is, the direction of his life, the goal of his life, the purpose of his life, and what his life is all about. Jesus is the righteousness of God. And that is now what Paul is aiming and pursuing. Paul took a big turnaround, as we said, when we observe someone uh, become a Christian, they took a turnaround. Now, he is not living for himself, but he is living for someone far greater than himself. Then what does that mean by Jesus is my purpose? Let's uh, go through that point. And Paul actually explained that in three points, okay? Uh, please keep your Bible open. Let's go to verse 10 and 11. Okay. Verse 10 says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. What does that say? The purpose is, the three points, to know Jesus, suffer with Jesus, and resurrect like Jesus did. The purpose, the Paul is now 
and God and then headed towards is to know Jesus, suffer with Jesus, and resurrect like Jesus. He may have been a career-driven or academic weapon or big dog in politics, but now he's not. The purpose is to know Jesus, suffer with Jesus, and resurrect like Jesus. This is the purpose of Christian life, not only for Paul, but also for us. This is simply what Christians are living for, what we should live for. How simple is that? Three points. To know Jesus, to suffer with Jesus, and resurrect like Him. It does sound simple, but it is not simple when we are to living out. Living this simple truth may not be easy anymore because this is going to shape our life. This is going to de- dominate our schedule and it will determine our focus of our life. How do we shape our life? What would it look like if knowing Jesus, suffering with Jesus and resurrecting like Jesus in our day, in our daily life? What a day look like, looks like to serve this purpose? What would it look like if someone is dedicated to know Jesus? Would the person skip or be late to church on Sunday morning just because they didn't have enough sleep? Or what would it look like for someone who is dedicated to suffer with Jesus? Would the person choose to own rest, comforting himself or herself, over comforting church members' loss and grief because it was a busy day and I had seen too many people already? Or would the person choose to grieve with the member? What would it look like to serve our purpose? We want to think about this. This question helps us keep on track. What would it look like to serve our purpose? To know Jesus, to suffer with Jesus, and resurrect like Jesus. Point number three, future pursuit. Now we have this simple purpose, knowing, suffering with Jesus, and resurrecting like Him. But as we briefly consider this, this wasn't easy. Why is it not easy? Because we are going to have challenges and distractions. There's our positions. It's always like we are running, in, running with maps in our hand, but now we know where to go, but at the same time, getting there is a completely another story. What does it involve? It may look like breaking through wind, keeping up with your tight lungs and kick your leg for another stride. But if you are tired enough, if we are tired enough, Or when the journeys are long and hard enough, we miss our good old days, good old moments when it was comfortable. Just like how Israel missed the moments, the times in Egypt when they're out in wilderness. We may speak to ourselves, "Why why did I even start this journey? Why did I even want to go on this race in the first place? Then thinking about a warm cup of tea. A piece, of carrot, a piece of carrot cake at home, just cozily sitting down on the couch. Who knows? Well, then what should we do at this point? Should we just quit think, Should we just keep carrying on in our comfortable thinking? Or we should just quit thinking about it and focus on what's the goal? Remind ourselves why we are here, why we are on this journey, why we are in this journey. Because we are in Jesus Christ. We are found in Jesus Christ. That was the reason. Because we we felt and understood the grace and justice of God, and because we want to run this. We wanted to run this, this race for His sake. Paul was also going through the same problem with himself. The same question. Paul certainly was was a great example for us to follow, but that does not mean he sailed through his Christian journey. It was a hard time for him. Let us turn to verse 20. In 12 says this, not that, I already have, not, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. He's saying he's not perfect yet. He has not obtained it yet, but he has not finished yet. He's not the end point yet. He's still going. He's still running. And even he says he's pressing on. We see in verse 12 that Paul is pressing on. Even Paul was pressing on. He's feeling a pressure, opposition, friction, heat, challenge, distraction. Christians are to press on through the challenge for the purpose. So that's the end goal. Verse 13 says this, Brothers, I do not 
consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Forget what was behind, but straining forward, leading your body forward. What does that mean by forgetting what was behind? It is to chuck away what you cannot or do not love anymore, or chuck away what you used to love. Chuck away you love less for the sake of what you love the most, Jesus Christ. And He's moving forward from past, forgetting what was in behind, what was our past, not caring what was what I cared before. Yes, Paul had every reason to love his own past, what he achieved before. Paul had every reason to look back and blow his own trumpet on himself and simply give up the race. I had enough. Paul was a proud law teacher, political speaker, a pure-blooded Jew. The, the, the prime of his life, he earned and achieved everything he could at his time, and he forgets now what lies behind him. He forgets what he cherished before. He forgets what he used to love. Now he pursues the race through the challenge. That is a straining forward. Pursue the race through the challenge. Fixing your eyes to the end point, fixing your eyes to the finish line, fixing your eyes to the prize, fixing your eyes to be resurrected like Jesus. But we, unfortunately, have challenges every day. It is easier to, stand, easier to be said than be done. We have challenges. It is so great and prominent these days, and that is distraction. A distraction, because your phone, everything around us, trying to grab our time, grab our attention, our focus. It's been a while for a talk about um, the Melbourne Cup, but I, have a, I found very interesting stuff, which um, if you take a very close look to a racehorse, they've got something around their eyes. Um, they put a little a cloth over it. Um, they have a blinkers on. And do we know why they have a blinkers on? Before you answer it, some of you might say, obviously, because they got distracted. For those who thought that, good on you, that's exactly my point. Horses have a visual angle, angle of 320 degrees. They see what's in front of them. They see what's next to them. They almost see what's behind them. And they see so much. Not only they can see so wide and so much, but also they see in great resolution, great focus. They see everything in such high definition and long distance at the same time, they cannot process what they see. It's just too much. It's too distracting. They cannot pursue their own race on their own. They need help. And so as, the, so as us, we, need, we get distracted. We need help. This is our encouragement. This is the encouragement from the passage for us today. Let's put blinkers. Let's put blinkers on. Christian journey is hard and long and tough. And we get distracted. And there are even times we get lost sometimes. So why don't we let's put spiritual blinkers on so that we won't get distracted. Lack of the things we cannot love anymore. Lack of the things that, do, that does not serve our purpose anymore. If we put our points together, that's going to be three again. Past pursuit, present purpose, future pursuit. Let's consider this. What would a person, a Christian, look like if he or she have a truly understood the timeline of a Christian life? Past pursuit, present purpose, future, future pursuit. First, the person who understood the past pursuit is futile without Jesus then the person would not look back and divide their attention. They'll try to get our focus back. Then the person, he, when we will not have any regrets choosing Jesus over other priorities in our life. Second, the person who understood the present purpose is to know, suffer with, and resurrect like Jesus. Then the person would desire to know Jesus by listening, studying, and practicing the Word of God. The person who would participate in suffering with other Christians in their grief and their suffering. 
in their financial support, sometimes you have to fight, fight for the gospel. Number three. Third, the person who understood the, the future pursuit is forgetting the past, but straining forward for the goal that God gave us, straining forward to, to the resurrection like Jesus, then the person will run the rest of his life or her life to the end, fixing eyes on Jesus. Whew. That's the main three points, and that's quite much to take, doesn't it? You have to, we have to know Jesus. We have to suffer with Jesus. We want to resurrect like Jesus. It seems quite a lot to take, but also it is quite a lot to do. It sounds like we should never miss a Bible study, prayer meeting, Bible reading, church service, loving our brothers and sisters, reaching out to the poor, the financially supporting missionaries, and people in need, and etc., etc., etc. There's so much stuff to do. The Word of God today seems to be requiring us to perform, perform to make it until the goal. Then the question is, where do we find our strength? Do we have a strength to do all of these? Do we have a strength in ourselves? Let me ask you, yes or no? No. Do we have a fiery zeal that never put away within ourselves? Yes or no? No. Do we have an iron will to fight through the challenges and heat and opposition? Yes or no? No. Do we have a righteousness of our own by the law without Jesus? Yes or no? No. But can we finish this race on our own? Yes or no? No. We simply can't. We can't do it. We may hold up for a few days and we'll flee away. It's hard. But with Jesus, who made us his own, who took off us to hold of us, who does not let go of us, who's not giving up on us, is getting hold of us. He's going to help us. Why don't we turn to verse 12? It says this, Not that I already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Let me read that to you in the NIV version again. Not that I already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. We have hope. We have hope just because Jesus got a hold of us. Because Jesus is holding us. Because Jesus is holding us, we can pass to the finish line. We may pass the race, that's why the upward calling of God can only be made in Jesus Christ. And verse 14 says this, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus. Without Jesus, there is no goal. Without Jesus, there is no prize. There is, without Jesus, there is, a, there is no calling. But Jesus is holding us. When Jesus holds us, there is a goal. There is prize and there is God's calling. Now we find our strength to forget what was behind, but strain forward to Jesus, to our purpose. Please join us in our prayer. Dear God of righteousness and grace, we give you honor and glory for your great work in creation and salvation. Though we may have at times we look back and briefly wishing to go back to our past, but Lord, we thank you for reminding us that we are found in Jesus. And there is your righteousness. It cannot be traded with anything else in the world. Lord, as we walk out of church today, help us remember our purpose, your high calling to living in knowing Jesus, suffer with him and resurrect like you. Give us strength and focus to fix our eyes onto you, forgetting what was behind. We pray all that in Jesus, who holds us, keeps us safe, who gives us purpose and strength and courage and blessed. I pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen.